like to uh, welcome everybody to the second webinar in our Life Sciences Fall Series. Today's topic is incorporating regulatory requirements into your content model. Um, managing your content when each region and country has different regulatory requirements and different language requirements can be really daunting. By building these requirements into your content model and architecture, you can improve your efficiency, reduce your liability, and serve your customers more effectively. During this session, we will explore some tips and techniques for creating a more robust content model to support your regulatory requirements. Our speaker today is Catherine brown Huckstra. Kit is an STC fellow and former STC Society president, certified trainer for the STC Certified Professional Technical Communicator Program, a member of the Colorado State University Media Hall of Fame for the Department of Journalism, and a 2017 Toastmasters District 26 Communication and Leadership Award recipient. She's an experienced consulting with over 25 years of experience in technical communication, much of it working with life sciences companies and localization teams. As principal of ComGenesis, Kit provides consulting and training to her customers on a variety of topics, including localization, content strategy, and content management. She speaks at conferences worldwide and publishes regularly in industry magazines. She also co-authored a book on managing virtual teams and recently edited the language of localization for the content Wrangler and XML Press. I'd like to ask um, everybody that you type your questions in the chat area at the bottom of the screen and uh, Kit can either answer them um, on the go or at the end of the session. And with this said, uh, we'll get started and we will make you, Kit, the presenter. Well, thank you guys for coming and uh, thanks Argos for having me here. Um, this is one of my favorite topics is to talk about localization in life sciences. So I get to combine two of my, two of my loves today. Um, you already gave me a good introduction, so I don't need to put more except for that my Twitter feed or my Twitter handle is at kitcomgenesis and my blog is pangeapapers.com. Um, I have a couple of questions for you guys, for the audience as we begin to um, get started. So a couple of things, because it, it depends on um, how you're, how you're organizing things and how, you know, where you are and what kind of industry you're in, um, whether you're biotech, medical devices, pharma, um, and so on, um, what your pain points are around regulatory content. So if you could type into the chat, what are your pain point? what are some of your pain points about regulatory content? And even Annetta will um, break in at some point during the, convert, uh, during our conversation today and um, will give me the answers that you type. The other question I have for you, are you currently using structured content as CMS? And if so, which ones are you using? Um, and then the other thing is, how many languages are you localizing into? And what regulatory bodies do you answer to? Uh, because those, the answers to those questions as we're going along, if you're thinking about those, are going to, influence how you approach um, incorporating regulatory content more effectively into your content model. So again, what are your pain points with regulatory content? Are you currently using structured content in a CMS? And if so, which one? Um, how many languages do you localize into and what regulatory bodies? And I know that's a lot of questions, but, um, and, and as I said, even Annetta will um, break in a, a little bit so schema, 30 languages, TVA, okay, great. So regulatory content kind of comes in two flavors. There's the explicit content, which is a lot of what um, I'm showing on the screen right now, uh, where you have to have drug labeling, you have to have a certain 
certain warning labels, um, warranty information, that kind of thing. That's explicit regulatory content. You're pretty much required to have those exact things with very little variant, um, depending on what region and country you're in. And then there's the, Im the indirect regulatory content, and that is actually a little bit harder to track because, for example, you might have a required clinical protocol for a particular medical device in one country and a totally different protocol or a somewhat different protocol in a different country or region. And so how do you track that? And, and the answer might be that you have different ways of tracking those types of information or it, maybe it's a modification to what you're doing right now. So think about what kinds of content that you are dealing with, whether it's explicit, like the warning label, the labeling and that kind of thing, or in, uh, indirect, like uh, VAT regulations that influence how you set up the taxing in your financial software, for example, or how you um, do the clinical protocol in a particular country. Um, some of the other challenges with the regulatory content that I see, uh, change management. Anytime you're talking about content management and content strategy, change management comes up as a problem. Uh, even very, very large companies struggle with change, appropriate change management. And by, and I'm not talking about, in this particular case, the human side of change management when you're talking about um, strategic initiatives and that kind of thing. I'm talking about the technical side of change management where, where you're, how do you decide when and how to make a change in your content um, before release, for example. So, um, you know, if you have if you have a level one change, which is somebody's going to die if you don't um, make the change, then you do that all the time. Level two is important, but not, you know, and so on and so forth. So, um, and the reason that change management is so important is if you're translating into 50 languages and you wait until you've sent all your content to localization to make a change in your con in your English source content, you're costing the company millions of potentially hundreds of thousands of to millions of dollars um, in relocalizing costs for relocalization or in delays in getting that product to market. And so managing change around the content is super important for that. And then when you add regulatory into the mix, um, that adds another layer of complexity. So you've got the source content changes, and then you've got localization on top of that, and then you've got regulatory on top of that. And that you really need to be thoughtful and proactive about your change management if you wanna be efficient and effective in that. And, and then the other, some other areas are technical reviews, um, who, who should be involved in those reviews, what happens when you have subject matter experts disagreeing, what happens when you have conflicting regulatory requirements, um, you know, the EU requires one thing, Japan requires something else, how do you manage that, how do you track that? Because with, as we know, with medical devices and pharma and biotech, um, you have to track from from inception to uh, end of cycle, end of life cycle, uh, what's happening with that product. And so the tracking requirements are a lot more onerous. And then, so how do you, how can you do that? How can you use your, your content management system to um, more effectively track uh, the content related to that product? And then, if you're using a regulatory compliance system, how do you integrate that with your content management system? Um, do they have an API that you can that you can use automatically? Are you using the same metadata to track regulatory compliance in your compliance system and content that relates to that particular regulation? 
in your content management system. So thinking about the tagging and metadata around that allows you to, um, as your as your allows you to find it more easily, allows you to track it more easily. Allows it, the tagging and metadata is kind of the backbone to being able to do all of these other things, and also then reuse. Um, if you have, for example, uh, I mean the easiest example is notes, cautions, and warnings. If you have notes, cautions, and warnings that are used all over your products and you have it worded slightly differently in one place than you do in another place, that could cause liability issues for your company um, if there's a problem. So you want those that warning label to be the same regardless of where it appears. And so um, maximizing your re reuse, that also saves on localization costs and uh, makes you more efficient and reduces your liability. So these are some of the challenges that you have with regulatory content and then when you add 50 languages on top of that or 20 languages on top of that, you are in, in 10 different regions or countries, uh, regulatory requirements, you are, you know, it gets a, it becomes very complex. Oops, uh, not sure why that did that. Um, Okay, I think you hit the wrong button. Um, so how do, so now that I've gone, oh no, this is really complex, how are we ever gonna do this? Well, let's start by looking at where you are. So doing a current state analysis. Before you can decide, you may have a vision of where you wanna be, but in order to get to where you wanna be, you have to know where you are. It's like. Um, when you're out hiking, you have to know what the name of the trailhead is in order to know how far it is and how hard it's going to be to get to your goal of the of climbing the, to the top of the peak, for example. So three things that, that will help you with that is doing some stakeholder interviews, um, doing a content audit and a workflow review. And then depending on, um, Depending on what you're doing, you may also want to include some competitive review in there. Um, so who are your stakeholders? Who are the people who make use of your regulatory content, who create your regulatory content, who have to answer to your regulatory content, um, who make the decisions about which markets you're going into. And it, these are some of the, this, these are examples of people who are stakeholders in say a medical device situation, but there may be other stakeholders. So you need to make sure that you're involving all of those people, um, not necessarily in the decision-making, but that, that you're aware of what their needs are and what their pain points are so that you can, um, so that any solution that you come up with doesn't make their life harder instead of easier because the whole goal of this is to make life easier for people. Um, so what you, what you would do here is identify the stakeholders and then spend some time prepping and, and schedule interviews with them. And the questions that you ask might be different depending on who they are, whether they're users of the content, whether they're developers of the content, whether they're, um, their compliance officers or, and so on. So. So think about what questions are important and what do you need to know? What is it that you don't know? And more importantly, what do you not know that you don't know um, about how they use and need that regulatory content to die, um, what format they need it in, for example, and so on. So think about, think about how, who, who's involved and what questions you need to ask those people um, in order to get good information the, to, to what your goal is for um, making this more, you know, what problem you're trying to solve. The next thing you need to do, and I probably should have put a slide in here about reviewing your corporate strategy as well, because that will tell you which markets are more important than others. Because at a certain time, you, you may have to perform a cost benefit analysis. If you're going into, Germany, obviously you're gonna, or the EU, you, you're you going to have to um, think about things differently than if you're going to Iceland 
or to Japan or to um, Thailand, for example, or to People's Republic of China, because your um, your requirements are going to be different. Your market size is going to be different. So think about your corporate strategy. And then as you look at your content strategy, look at where does regulatory content fit in our content, in our global content strategy? How is it being used? In the case of localization, are you currently localizing all of your regulatory content or are you having local business units create that content in the local language? And which way is better? Um, if if something only applies to Japan, do you really need it in English too? Or can you just leave it in Jap Japanese and and um, digest it that way through your system? And, and in some cases, it may be, um, you know, in some cases that might be the right way to go. In other cases, if there's a lot of overlap with the regulations, maybe what you want to say is we're going to go with whatever whoever's regulation is most stringent and um we're going to follow that and then everybody else will kind of be taken care of underneath you know as part of that it, it probably depends on or not probably it does it depends on what kind of regulatory content what kind of regulation you're talking about here so looking at your content strategy and deciding how you're going deciding again proactively um, what kind of scenarios you might run into with the regulatory content and how you're going to handle those scenarios in each each instance um, and then when you get to localization, that'll help you identify what you need to budget for in terms of localization as well. So we talked a little bit about the change management process. Equally important is the editing and QA process because preferential changes can affect your localization costs, but they can also affect inadvertently your compliance with the regulatory requirements. So if somebody is changing it, you know, is modifying the English preferentially or um, tweaking the wording because they don't like a particular word, they prefer a different one, but it's not what's required for the regulatory, that can cause problems. Um, the other thing is, and again, so you need to look at these processes. How mature are they? Because honestly, no tool can solve the, the process problems that you have. So if you are looking at, say, um, implementing a new content management system or a new regulatory compliance um, system, evaluating these processes as they exist today, and then looking at what needs to change in order to support a more efficient and effective uh, process, before you start implementing the tools, that will, one, it will give you some re requirement. It'll help you with your requirements analysis for the tool development and the tool selection. But it'll also help you become more aware of where you need to focus training for your team, where you need to um, improve your maturity, uh, process maturity, uh, in order to get these get this to the point where it better supports the regulatory requirements. So regulatory isn't is in a lot of different places in your ecosystem of your content, but it may not be everywhere. So when you if you make a mind map of your content e ecosystem, kind of a high level thing like this, this is just one example. Um, Zoom in on the areas where regulatory really affects the content, the output from that area, and then look at the type of content. Is it explicit regulatory content, like warranty information, or is it implicit, like built into um, the way that you give instruction on a particular device or, or medical, a medicine, um, pharmacy, pharmaceutical? 
So think about zoom in on that content ecosystem. And so, and you'll notice that I started big picture, you know, I started at the top and I'm working down through this funnel and getting more and more detailed as we go through the process. Because if you, if you go from bottom up, you miss things because you're, you know, if you start at the most detailed level, you, you may not know that somebody over on the other side of the building is doing something similar or something that actually interferes with what you're doing if you're starting at the most detailed level. Whereas if you start at the big picture and work your way down, you may, you, you may identify places where there are silos, where you can break down those silos and where you can work um, cross-functionally. So, so that's why, and then, so start so look at the whole thing and then zoom in on the aspects of it that are the most important and most critical. And there, and pick an area to start with. Um, probably when you're, when you're implementing changes here, you may want to start with a pilot project. You may want to phase things in based on, um, criticality. Uh, based on, you know, if you're getting uh, in trouble with a regulatory body because you aren't aren't doing something the way that you're supposed to do, that's going to drive kind of where you start. Um, but if you start with the big picture in mind, you know, then where you're you're not going to get sidetracked. You're going to you're going to see how that fits in that little aspect of the project fits in with the whole. So once you've zoomed in on the content ecosystem where you need to focus on your regulatory content, um, you can do a content audit. And this is kind of an example of the headings that I use in a spreadsheet for, in this case, it's a, it's a web-based one. Um, but it, you can, you can use something similar or to another tool to identify where the problems are. Um, you may have, in, for example, instead of culturally new, neutral, one of the another field that you might have in here is: is this what type of regulatory content is it? Um, and and how detailed again you, you get with your content audit depends on your budget and where you're at. If you're at the beginning. What tends to happen with content audits is you you identify a whole slew of issues by reviewing uh, at a fairly high level your content, and then as you resolve those issues, you dive deeper and deeper and deeper into the content. So um, the first time you look at something, you might say, "Oh, wow! All of those graphics for X Y Z product." Um, have the same issue. So let's fix all of those and then go on to something else, for example. Um, or maybe you'll find that all your warnings are worded slightly differently wherever they appear and we need to work on eliminating duplication and streamlining our errors, notes, cautions, and warnings um, content. So, but that's what the content audit will tell you. It gives you some prior, it gives you some ideas of what the big issues are. And then um, you can prioritize what you're gonna do about those issues. Uh, the other thing that you don't need to necessarily do a full inventory of every content asset that you own in order to know what the problems are. I have found that if you look at 10 to 20% of the content in a particular, say, product line, it will tell you 80 to 90% of the issues. So, because, because issues, the issues that you're looking for tend to be permeate the entire content um, ecosystem. And so, if you solve one issue, you can solve it. Or, or if you identify one issue in one product line, chances are good that that same issue exists in other product lines and so on. And so you can go and you can say, okay, this is what we're gonna do, do to solve this in the entire ecosystem. And this is how we're going to um, incorporate this into our content model and, <clears throat> and architecture. So, and, and when you're coming up with solutions, anything you can do to automate or um, take 
the decision making piece out of out of the equation to make it easier for people to comply. That's what you want to do. And again, you have to do at every step in this process, you have to do a con cost benefit analysis. If you're spending, you know, because there is such a thing in structure as too much structure and just like, and that's just as bad, maybe even worse than not enough structure, because if you get too much structure, then um, it becomes really onerous to maintain and you spend all of your time being a servant to the to the structure instead of serving your customers and that's not what you want so you have there's balance there that you have to have to think about but wherever you can if you automate it and take the take the people out of the equation you eliminate the the chance of human error and um ensure that you're you're complying with regulatory requirements um especially if it's like really fiddly details um, that that you need to comply with. So that's where we, once we we've done the audit, now we're looking at the structure. Are the met is the metadata is the tagging appropriate? Is this tagging and metadata allowing us to pull the right content to the right place at the right time in the right format for the right audience? And um, you know this this again becomes um is dependent on on what's going on and what issues you find in the content audit but you need to find out how your structure is supporting and also how it's interfering with your ability to serve up the content the way you need to and then streamlining the streamlining your content um this is not only going to save you on localization costs but it's also going to save you on um, on maintenance costs because you don't want 15 different versions of something, right? You want one version, maybe a variant if it's a particular product line or something has different requirements or, you know, if you have with regulatory information, you may have regional or country differences that that require you to maintain different copies, but you need to tie those together so that they that you know um, where, when, and where you can um, consolidate and streamline. So really looking at how you can do that, and and this is a little bit time consuming, but when once you do that, once you commit to it. Um, you can set up a process where you go and do an audit and a review every year and where you periodically go in and do this streamlining function. And if your team is more aware of what the issues might be um, with not streamlining and if they understand how what they're doing affects the teams downstream or localization or other regulatory teams, <clears throat> then you can, um, you know, then it then it becomes a, a much more uh, likely to be successful, right? So people need to understand the why of what they're doing. And the metadata, the, the metadata, I would say if you if you only have budget to do two things, look at your change management and look at your metadata because these two things fixing fixing issues in these two areas will help you probably more than anything else um, and then looking at and and so then looking at um, your QA process as well but but if you can solve these issues then then what you get is people aren't recreating something because they can't find it in the system or they're not duplicating something that already exists in the system you know not duplicating across regions something that is the same requirement so so again if you if you can set up your metadata and your taxonomy and your um, tagging appropriately that will that will really help you with um, making sure that you're your content is getting to the right place at the right time in the right format. 
So the other thing that you need to look at is your tools. One of the mistakes that companies make when they're going to structured content and content management um, or implementing any tool really is that they get excited about the shiny tool and don't really think about and don't do enough of a needs analysis and requirements analysis before they go selecting the tool. Um, don't don't get blinded by the shiny the shiny uh, features and and things. Really think about how is it going to work in your current milieu, in your current processes. And again, no technology in the world is going to solve people problems. You know, if you have problems with your teams, your your customer service team, your tech support team, your documentation team, and your regulatory team aren't talking to each other, a tool is not going to fix that. So um, <clears throat> when you're reviewing your tools, though, think about how do they integrate with each other? Do they support efficient and effective workflows? What needs do you have that your current tools aren't meeting? And this is where some of the people and process um, things may come into play. Are there areas that you could that right now are onerous and boring and nobody wants to do them and you have to pull teeth to get it done um, that could be automated? Automate the boring stuff. Let the people focus on the cool stuff, the, the really exciting, interesting, um, complex problem solving that people are good at because machines are dumb, right? Machine, a machine, but a machine can go run through a million lines of code, run through a million pages of documentation, and find all of the instances where something is duplicated much more efficiently than a person can. But when it comes to evaluating contextually whether this you know this information that you found should be different that is more of a people question than a machine question so automate but automate smartly <clears throat> so now you've You've gotten through the process of the content audit. You've identified where you're at. You've done some analysis of of the data that you've collected. And you know, if you're using a consult, you know, if, if your team has um, come together after that analysis, they've come up with some some recommendations and some priorities have kind of fallen naturally out of that. Um, and the way I like to prioritize things is, is it easy, is it cheap, and is it going to have the high, what impact is it going to have? So the number one priority should be something that's easy, cheap, and has high impact, right? Um, because you want, you're looking for some things that are quick wins to encourage people. It's sort of like when you're playing a video game, if you don't, um, I'm getting a network connection message. Are you guys still hearing me? Yes, we can. Okay, good. Um, so it, it, just like in a computer game, if you, if you start out going for the level 80 goal, you're going to fail if you're at level one. So Start start with the priorities that are easy to do, inexpensive to implement, and have high impact, and and then your team will feel like they're they're winning a little bit, and then you can add those harder goals in or those longer term goals in later. So so when you're setting the goals, that that attainable need, needs to be there, but it, they also need to be specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time bound. So you know, the smart, the smart goal setting. And, and if you wanted to um, add something a little bit risky, right? Because you want, to, you want to have a stretch goal in there at some point, but you want to have your team feel like they're winning first and then build in some stretch goals as you're, as you're going. And then as you, after you've had time, you know, after a certain period of time, re reevaluate. 
Okay, so you're gonna, so you set your goals. Now you've got to build that model. And what that model is going to look like depends on what your specific needs are, what type of regulatory requirements you have, what type of system you're using. Um, because, you know, no matter how good the CMS is that you're using, it has limitations that are going to force you into certain decisions versus other decisions. So that's why the, the needs analysis and requirements analysis before you select the tool is so important because it, you want it to support your requirements and your needs as much as possible, not cause other needs, right? Um, so build your model, think about where, how you're using it. And it, you know, the other question to ask is, should we be using it this way, right? Should we be putting um, this particular clinical protocol in this particular um, part of the documentation or should it be somewhere else? Is this the most useful place for it? So it's gotta be usable and useful. So usable, means they can find it, right? And they can follow it. But useful means they need that information in order to be successful. So there's a difference between being able to, you know, if I can find the hammer, but I need the screwdriver, doesn't really help me, right? Both of those are useful, are usable, but not useful. If the hammer is not useful, in the situation where I need a screwdriver. The screwdriver is not useful in the situation that I need the hammer, but they're both usable. Does that make sense? So, so as you're building your model, think about how you are going to connect all of these things. How are you going to track them? How are you going to modify your, your metadata in order to um, support the provide a framework for your model and prioritize the, the you know this can be if you have hundreds of thousands of pages of documentation or hundreds of thousands of content assets in your content management system this can feel overwhelming so prioritize what content you're going to focus on first and then when you get that content good um, to the point where you are happy with it, then move on to the next set of content. Um, this is where maybe having a pilot project might be good, especially if you're making major changes to your workflow or to your um, content management system. Having a pilot project, um, preferably one that's not critical path, um, so that if something goes wrong, you're not costing the company money by delaying a release or something like that. Um, <clears throat> so prioritize what, how you're going to do it and then gradually ripple out, you know, as you go. Now, when you, when it comes to, um, to like wording changes and things like that, there are, if you're, if you're using controlled language, which is a whole nother topic, but if you're using controlled language, or um, want to set up style guide rules and you don't want to, this is a good place where you could automate some of that um, to support the human editor because it's really boring to go through a million pages of documentation and, and not very cost effective for a human being to go through a million pages of documentation and change one term, right? Um, there are tools out there that can help support um, controlled language style guide management and that kind of thing. So for example, um, Hyper STE, if you're using simplified technical English specification, um, you can set that up to, to manage your vocabulary and it'll flag where there are issues. Um, Acrolinks is, is another program that um, you can set up a style guide rules and things like that and have have it automatically tell you where there are issues and then the editor can focus on those areas and work with the authors to to fix those so so that can help you with your prioritization as well 
Um, and then you're you know, of course, you're going to test publish and you're going to test the system to see how your changes are working, how you're, you know, if you, because one of the things you don't want to do is create more problems by the, you know, you solve a problem over in this side uh, on one little area and you cause 10 other problems somewhere else. So you don't want to do that. So as much, much as you can in the content strategy piece and the in the design piece, you want to um, make sure you've identified all those potential I issues or, or concerns, but then it, at a certain point, you have to just do it and test it and then evaluate it and, um, and then make modifications. You know, this is an iterative process. It's an ongoing process. It's not, um, it's not probably going to be a one-off type situation because as regulatory changes get made or as um, as you add new regions um, or countries to to the mix, you're going to have to go through a little bit, at least part of this exercise again. Um, so, but but the the key here is to be as forward thinking and as um, proactive about it and to design the system robustly and flexibly enough to to support things that you don't even know could become a thing you know 10 years ago augmented and virtual reality really wasn't a thing for the average person now it's starting to become more and more common um, is your content ready for that is your content ready for adding a new region of regulatory um, requirements? Um, you know, the EU recently updated its privacy requirements. Is If you're complying with that, then you're going to be complying with U.S. privacy requirements because the U.S. is less stringent. So how do you how do you evaluate that? How do you do that? So if you think about the how, and you think about the why, um, it, it will help you devise a system that is flexible and robust at the same time. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Um, what co what questions do you have? And there's my contact information if you need it. So I don't see any questions um, at the bottom of the screen, so feel free to type your questions or um, jump in and ask them if there are any. Nothing. Maybe you did such an outstanding job that there are no questions. So somebody says they have unclear requirements for some of their regulatory Thing. And that, that can be very true because a lot of the re regulations are written in legalese instead of people language. And so um, there can be a lot of gray areas depending on what you're doing. So one of the, one of the people says that um, they're not using structured content or a CMS. I really recommend that you move toward that. Because especially if you're if you're trying to expand into other regions and things like that, and you're managing a lot of assets, um, and by assets I mean you're you have chunks of content that are, you know, in multiple places and things like that. The, having a CMS will automate some of them and take away some of that mental strain that you're having with trying to figure out what goes where and, and so on. All right, are there any other questions that uh, you'd like Kit to answer? No? All right, then I think we're done um, for today. Kit, thanks very much um, for this webinar. We really appreciate it. And um, I wish everybody a, a good uh, rest of the day or good evening for some of you in Europe. Thanks very much, Eve and Annette. I appreciate it. Have a great day. Thanks. Bye-bye.